Blockchain technology is here to stay. It offers too many business benefits, but it is also an existential threat to the existing banking industry because it disintermediates them. I don't need a bank to hold my money. I don't need a bank to approve me for a loan. I don't need a bank to facilitate the settlement of my trade. I just simply don't need a bank. And this is an existential threat. And that is my opinion why Jamie Dimon runs around the country saying, I hate Bitcoin. And if I were the government, I would ban it. This content is brought to you by BitGo, which is one of the top crypto custodians in the crypto industry. BitGo works with many big companies and brands, such as Pantera Capital, Bitstamp, and Bitcoin IRA. Nike also selected BitGo to power its wallets for its NFTs. And BitGo has many great services, such as hot wallets, custodial wallets, self-managed cold wallets, and NFT wallets. Many institutions trust BitGo with its top-level security and incredible services, such as being able to deploy your capital while it's in custody, which includes lending, borrowing, trading, staking, DeFi access, and more. If you'd like to learn more about BitGo, please visit bitgo.com, link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Rick Edelman, who's the founder of Edelman Financial Services, also the founder of the Digital Assets Council of Financial Prof Professionals, uh, as well as the author of over 10 books on personal finance and the host of the Truth About Your Future podcast. Rick, welcome back. Always great to be with you, Tony. Thanks. Rick, we've spoken over the years, we've talked about the adoption of crypto. And, you know, over the years, we've talked about the upcoming Bitcoin ETFs. Well, they are here. And yeah. I would love to get your thoughts on these ETFs going live and the performance we've been seeing with the inflows. Yeah, it's been a long uh, struggle. Uh, we've It's been 10 years since the first application was submitted to the SEC by the Winklevoss twins back in 2013. Uh, every, every application as we know, has always been rejected by the SEC over the past decade. And finally, uh, as a result of the Grayscale lawsuit last summer, the SEC was forced, they didn't want to, but the court forced them to um, approve uh, not just the Grayscale application, but the SEC agreed to approve all of the applications that it had in front of it. So there are now 10, as of January 10th, 10 ETFs now trading uh, on a daily basis. And it is an exciting time for Bitcoin as a result of this. This has been widely regarded for years as the holy grail of crypto. Uh, we knew that this was the key linchpin that would push crypto and particularly Bitcoin into the mainstream for investment management. Mm. Now, Rick, uh, with the launch and how things have been going so far, um, has it blown past your expectations or were you anticipating this type of uh, demand? We were widely expecting this based on all the research we'd done, all the surveys uh, of advisors over the past several years. We knew that there was an extraordinary level of demand for this product uh, and advisors were just clamoring for it. Um, and without the ETFs, the vast majority of financial advisors have not been able to recommend Bitcoin to clients because there was no vehicle available for them to do so. Their compliance departments did not allow them to recommend Bitcoin in any other format or methodology. They couldn't open an account with an exchange like Coinbase or, or Kraken. They couldn't um, provide clients with a hot or cold wallet uh, in a DeFi platform uh, like MetaMask. Um, the esoteric, cumbersome products, uh, private placements and hedge funds are generally available only to accredited investors. They have significant issues, lack of liquidity, high minimums, high fees. Firms were not making those products available to their advisors. And so for all these reasons, advisors were shut out effectively from the crypto marketplace from an investment recommendation perspective. And everybody knew that ETFs solve all of those problems. Investment firms would be able to recommend them. Compliance departments would approve them. Investment management teams would okay them. And everybody, investors and advisors alike, are highly familiar with these ETFs because ETFs are the most popular investment vehicle in the country uh, with uh, trillions and trillions. I think it's $13 trillion now in assets. Uh, and so it's a, it's a no-brainer. So we knew that once these ETFs became available, 
uh, financial advisors and investment management firms would uh, jump at the opportunity, and we're already seeing that. Having said all that, Tony, I do have to say that the speed of adoption is exceeding my expectations. I thought it would take a year before we'd see massive inflows, um, but we're seeing them already. You know, we've had twenty billion dollars of inflows already. We're seeing a billion dollars a day at this point, and so the rate. Uh, of adoption is even faster than I thought, but we're just still at the beginning. I'm expecting $150 billion of flows over the next year and a half from independent advisors alone. That doesn't count the wirehouses or uh, regional broker dealers or family offices or institutional investors or retail investors, just independent advisors alone. We're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of billions potentially flowing into Bitcoin over the next several years. Now, why do you think there is such a demand for Bitcoin? I partially know this answer, but I want to make sure the folks who are new to the asset class um, hear it from someone like you, um, in a sense that is there pent up demand, like you were saying, people couldn't touch it because of the regulatory aspects, but also maybe rising debt and they're looking for harder assets. What do you think are the catalysts? Well, you have two separate issues here going on. Number one is what's the Bitcoin premise? Why are people interested in Bitcoin as an investment or asset class? Uh, and there are lots of reasons that people cite. Uh, some of it is store of value. They like the idea that Bitcoin is an asset that it retains its value compared to the dollar, which diminishes in value uh, over over time. Some people view it as uh, an alternative investment opportunity compared to stocks and bonds and real estate, where Bitcoin is a wonderful a additive for a diversified portfolio because it's uh, price movements are non-correlated to those other asset classes. So Bitcoin's price moves independently of stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, oil, commodities, you name it. And that makes it a wonderful addition under modern portfolio theory to add to the portfolio. Uh, so some people, a lot of people, uh, hundreds of millions around the world argue that Bitcoin is an outstanding investment opportunity. Some also argue that it is an outstanding um, technological innovation for commerce. They note that blockchain technology allows businesses to operate faster, cheaper, safer, with greater transparency and inclusion than you can with existing business methodologies. Bitcoin, at the end of the day, is just software. And this software code is better than the existing software code that businesses are currently using. And this is why we're seeing mass adoption of this by banks all around the world. Nike generated $200 million in sales last year of its NFTs, dropping right to the bottom line because NFTs are virtually no cost to Nike to create. Starbucks has been doing its uh, loyalty rewards program with NFTs. We have uh, companies from Parmigiano Reggiano to the Norwegian Seafood Association, all using blockchain technology for anti-counterfeiting purposes. Mm -hmm. So there are tremendous commercial use cases, uh, which is growing exponentially. So a lot of people cite the value of Bitcoin and other digital assets for those reasons. But at the end of the day, you have the investment management piece. Mm -hmm. Even though you might like the idea of Bitcoin, even though you might be favorable to it, if, there, if it's not available to you in a format that is conducive for you to do business as an advisor, then you're not going to be able to allocate to the client. Uh, this is a big reason why financial advisors don't recommend artwork to their clients or comic books or rare coins. There's simply no effective vehicle for an advisor in their practice management to do this. The ETF solves all those problems. So people who like the idea of Bitcoin for whatever reason, store of value, investment benefit, commercial benefit, whatever the purpose is, you like Bitcoin. Now you finally have a way to exercise that like to activate your interest and allocate to Bitcoin via these ETFs. And that's why we're seeing firms falling over themselves getting involved at this point. Rick, could you take us behind the curtain a bit? Um I'm very curious about this process. So let's say BlackRock, right? They're out there educating different folks about their ETF. Here are the fees. Here's the custody, so on and so forth. As an RIA, an investment advisor, um, and I'm hearing this, what are my next steps that I will be able to access that and then start talking to my clients about it? Yeah, the real key, um, Tony, is to recognize that at the end of the day, we're talking about practice management. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the real issue is 
you know, great, I like the asset, but how do I do it? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, it's a daunting issue because a lot of advisors don't know a whole lot about Bitcoin. Their staffs don't know a whole lot about it. They don't understand the underlying technology necessarily. And they've never had experience explaining this to their clients who know even less than they do. So how do you begin? And it's really quite simple. First of all, simply recognize these are exchange traded funds. And you as an advisor know all about ETFs. You use them in your practice. Your clients are familiar with them. Your staff are familiar with them. They're not complicated at all. They're just ETFs that are investing in a particular sleeve of the investment world. And you already have gold ETFs, you have oil ETFs and energy ETFs, you have commodity ETFs, you have foreign ETFs, you have emerging markets ETFs, you have small cap stock ETFs, you have bond ETFs. Well, now there's a Bitcoin ETF. So you don't have to do a whole lot of due diligence on these different ETFs to evaluate them for their investment purposes, because all of them own the same thing, Bitcoin. This is a single asset ETF. There's nothing easier than that. You don't need to become an expert in Bitcoin or blockchain technology, because all of these are identical. They're all only buying Bitcoin. So the analysis, the due diligence you want to engage in is which of these ETFs do you want to buy, recognizing they're all buying the same thing. So what, therefore, are their differences? Number one is their fee. Mm. The fees range from 19 basis points to one and a half percent, which is 80% more expensive. So they range all over the board. Uh, Franklin Templeton is the cheapest at 19 bips. Bitwise is the second cheapest at 20 bips. Many would argue there's really not much of a difference between those two. Several others are at 25 bips. A few others are in the 30s. Uh, The outlier is Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which is 150 basis points. So very simple and easy. Look at their prices. Second, look at their custodian. Who is the company that is custodying their assets? And what are the safety mechanisms, the security protocols that they have in place? How confident, comfortable are you that the Bitcoins are safe, that you're buying on behalf of your clients? Uh, Third, who's the surveillance partner? Uh, This is something that is unique to these ETFs. You don't have that in a normal um, stock fund. The surveillance partner is very simple. This is a company that each of these ETFs are hiring to determine what is the current price of Bitcoin. They surveil the marketplace on a global basis to identify the actual one and true current price of Bitcoin. So you want to know who is their surveillance partner uh, and what is their trading method methodology? Are they going to trading desks like Jane Street? Or are they going to public exchanges like Coinbase? This will determine how tight the spreads are. It'll determine how low they can keep the trading expenses. Uh, So you want to look at different features like those. Uh, And we've produced at DACFP a really nifty grid. We have an advisor toolkit that's free that has a lot of content, educational material on these ETFs, but there's a one-page grid, a comparison chart that compares all these 10 ETFs across 16 different categories so you can very easily compare one to another to help you make the decision. So that's your first step. Choose the ETF that you like. We find a lot of advisors are choosing two rather than just one um, Mm. because this way you could have two different ETFs that have two different custodians, for example, to reduce your hacker risk. Mm. So choose one or two ETFs. Second, decide which of your clients you want to recommend these to. Mm. Some advisors will give them to every client, but many advisors recognize that not all clients will want it, or maybe it's not in the best interest of every client. So decide which of your clients you feel should have an allocation. Third, contact those clients. Tell them what you're planning to do, what your recommendation is, and why. The Bitcoin is an excellent diversification tool for long-term diversified portfolios that uh, it can be additive to the portfolio. It actually improves all of the uh, smart, uh, all the uh, modern portfolio theory statistics. It, it uh, You improve the Sortino ratio, the Sharpe ratio, 
uh, max drawdown, standard deviation, all of these statistics get better by the addition of Bitcoin to the portfolio, which is kind of uh, counterintuitive because everybody thinks Bitcoin is so volatile. Why would I want to put such a risky asset into the portfolio? Actually, history tells us that adding Bitcoin to the portfolio lowers the overall risk. Yes. So it, it's really good for an awful lot of clients. Uh, once you do those three things, choose the Bitcoin decide which of your clients to recommend it to and talk to them. The final question is the allocation. Mm -hmm. What percentage of the portfolio will you allocate? Most advisors, according to our research, are doing two to 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, and simple and easy. Now, on that note, we've heard the 80-20 investment rule. Then I think some folks have changed to 60-40. But as this asset class grows and you have other ETFs that are issued aside from Bitcoin, um, do you see the portfolio split evolving to maybe 60, 30, 10, 10 being to digital assets? I think different advisors will make that decision on their own. Uh, I think that over time, as uh, two things happen, you will see higher and higher allocations. Mm -hmm. The two things that have to happen, number one, is a broader array of crypto products. Right now, we have Bitcoin futures ETFs. We have spot Bitcoin ETFs. We have 2X and 3X funds. We have inverse funds. Right. That's about it. They're all in the Bitcoin frame. There are applications pending before the SEC now for Ethereum ETFs. That will bring about... Uh, Ethereum futures and 2X and 3X inverse and inverse funds. And then you'll have, since you'll have ETFs of Bitcoin and ETFs of Ethereum, you're going to get combination mm -hmm. funds that will own both Bitcoin and Ethereum in a single fund. Some of those will be actively managed. Some of them will be passively managed. Some of them will be 50-50. Others will be 75-25. So the ETF industry is really good at inventing products. Mm -hmm. So you can expect a huge array of product availability. And that product availability will create opportunity for the advisor to increase the allocation. You know, if I'm doing 2% to Bitcoin, maybe I'll do 2% to Ethereum. That's a total of 4%. While all that is happening, one other thing has to happen. In addition to product availability, has to be tolerance. Mm -hmm. Meaning, as more and more investors own Bitcoin through the Bitcoin ETF, and they become more and more comfortable with it over time. And they begin to see Bitcoin's price performance, which we think is going to be very strong over the next several years, people will become more and more comfortable with allocating more and more money to it. So between availability of product and a willingness to invest in those products, you might well be right, Tony, that the two to three percent allocations I'm referring to today are going to become five and then seven and perhaps even higher. It's interesting that when I first wrote my book, The Truth About Crypto, I recommended a one percent allocation. Mm. And now everybody is pretty much talking about two to three percent. Uh, the CFA Institute talks about as much as five percent. So people are becoming already far more comfortable than they were just a few short years ago. Yeah, it's fascinating. And we're seeing, because the U.S. approved the Bitcoin ETFs, we're hearing out of London, they want to explore an, what they would call an ETP. Hong Kong is also talking about this. So it seems like there's going to be growing demand for Bitcoin um, since the U.S. has made its move and, and game theory is going to play out. Uh, it's fascinating to watch this uh, unfold before us. It really is. And these ETFs are available all around the world already. They're in Canada. They're, uh, as you said, in uh, Europe. Uh, London's looking at them. So are many countries in the Far East. They're going to be ultimately everywhere simply because of investor demand. Larry Fink was very blunt about this. The main reason BlackRock launched its ETF was because they were getting demand from their clients. And let's face it, they're in the ETF business. If there's a product you want to buy, they're going to make it available to you. You know, they're not they're not taking a uh, an attitude other than that. It's smart business, and so everybody's going to get involved. You made an interesting comment. I want to highlight on Tony. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that in London they're looking at an ETP, not an ETF. Hmm. What most people don't know is that the ten ETFs here in the U.S. the spot Bitcoin ETFs are in fact not ETFs. They are ETPs. Hmm. 
uh, this is a distinction that nobody other than um, finance nerds care about. Uh, an ETP, an exchange traded product, is brought to the market under the Securities Act of 1933. Mm-hmm. ETFs are brought to the market under the Investment Company Act of 1940. I don't think anybody other than uh, nerds like me are going to care about that. Um, and people will sometimes ask, what's the difference between an ETF and an ETP? It's kind of like the old dogs and animals riff. You know, all dogs are animals, but not all animals are dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so all ETFs are ETPs, but not all ETPs are ETFs. You also have ETCs uh, and ETNs. Uh, you, have, you have exchange-traded commodities and exchange-traded notes and exchange-traded funds. I don't think anybody really cares but nerds like me. Oh, yeah. So that's, you know, it's funny. I was reading up about it just the other day because someone in my live chat doing a live stream asked about it. And I was like, let me Google it right away. And I saw that ETPs are the banner, overarching banner, and you have underneath these different products, ETF, ETNs, ETCs. And what is so fascinating is that seven of these new funds call themselves ETFs, even though they technically are not. Read the S1. Every one of them acknowledges they are organized under the Securities Act of 33 as an ETP, but they call themselves an ETF. Hmm. But I guess it doesn't really affect the performance or anything. It's just naming convention. No. There are some investor protections that exist under ETFs that don't exist under ETPs, but those investor protections are really not terribly material in my view. The protections that do exist under ETPs are the protections that investors really do care about. Disclosure, transparency, uh, equal pricing, fair trading, all that kind of good stuff. What really matters does exist. Otherwise, the SEC wouldn't allow ETPs to be on the market. So I don't think people need to worry about it very much. So Rick, hard question for you. And this is something I per- I'm personally curious about as well. We are a bit in uncharted territory because this is the first time we have these ETPs <laughs> in the United States. Um, will there be a sell-off, some sort of sell-off at the peak of this bull market? As we've seen, Bitcoin follows a four-year cycle. It'll go from the bear market low to a euphoric blow-off top. So will these ETFs sell off? Or you think maybe 50% will st- be long-term holders who don't care? I'm waiting till 2040 or something like that. Oh, I think there's clearly going to be lots of sell-offs. This is the inherent nature of Bitcoin. It's a very volatile speculative asset. In fact, as we're doing this recording, Bitcoin is down uh, 10 or uh, 15 percent. Um, so uh, we're going to see this kind of thing. That's the way it's been for 15 years, ever since Bitcoin was invented. There's nothing new there. Um People who use these Bitcoin ETFs as part of a diversified portfolio will take advantage of this through rebalancing. Uh, This is a wonderful uh, strategy that we routinely use for our client portfolios. And the fact that we're adding Bitcoin to it just simply helps. Um, So it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, So yes, I think we will continue to see volatility. And no, I don't think that should upset or worry you uh, or shock you because it's just an inherent nature of the asset class. Absolutely. Now, not everyone is a fan. There's still some laggards on Wall Street. Uh, you got Vanguard and some of these other folks coming out saying, we're not going to list this. Although I, I'm starting to see some of them change their tune. What, what do you think that Vanguard and these folks will eventually capitulate? Well, we, we we saw two things happen at Vanguard recently. Number one, they made the announcement that they're not going to make available any of these Bitcoin ETFs to their customers, nor are they going to launch their own Bitcoin ETF. They are They do not believe Bitcoin ETF is appropriate for their client base. That's their first announcement. The second announcement a few weeks later was that their CEO is leaving the firm. So I'm saying Vanguard realized they made such a big mistake in making this announcement about no Bitcoin that they fired Tim. Of course, I'm making that up. That's not true, but it's a funny story. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I think in the future, Vanguard will change their mind. They are going to recognize that Bitcoin is not as scary and risky and inappropriate the way they're claiming it uh, that it is. Uh, And they will instead ultimately realize they are annoying their investors and they're missing out on a big uh, investment and market opportunity. And it's also, I think, hypocritical of them. I mean, they offer gold ETFs. They offer uh, emerging market ETFs. They offer foreign ETFs. Uh, I don't understand Vanguard's position at all. But other than Vanguard, I have not seen any firm draw a line in the sand saying, hell no. Instead, the opposite is happening. Every wirehouse in the country is very busy 
evaluating these ETFs to determine which of them they want to make available to their clients, which of their clients they want to recommend it to, and what the allocation ought to be. Those three questions I mentioned earlier. Uh, wirehouses are moving at a much faster pace than we expected. We thought it would be a year or more before they would engage, but many of them are already beginning to engage. Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, UBS, they're all, according to media reports, very active in this. Uh, and independent regional broker dealers are also moving very uh, quickly. LPL has already added it to their platform, as has Commonwealth. Uh, many others are doing the same. Uh, some of the biggest investment management firms and independent RIAs are also very busy with their due diligence. So there's a lot of activity going on really, really quickly. Uh, yeah, there are naysayers on Wall Street, but at the end of the day, Wall Street will sell the product you want to buy, and that's going to win the day. So, Rick, not to get too conspiratorial or too philosophical here, but do you think the likes of Vanguard and the Jamie Dimons, the, the, they're, they're, they hate the disruption that's happening? It, it, maybe it's, there's a bit of that where capital is flowing out of the traditional investment products, not all of it, obviously, but a good amount and going to crypto, uh, whether it's people investing directly or going through ETFs. Sure. That they don't like that. It's it's a disruption, right? It changes things. It changes the stronghold maybe they've had on the markets for a long time. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform. And on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support. And I'll let you get back to the content. Yeah, there's no question about that, Tony. This disruptive technology, let's remember, Satoshi's goal when inventing Bitcoin was to replace fiat currencies around the world. Satoshi was fed up with the global financial system, which brought us the 2008 credit crisis, and Satoshi wanted a better way. And although that experiment failed, Bitcoin is not a currency, never will be, You know, it's too volatile. Uh, this is why stable coins were invented to solve that problem. Uh, blockchain technology is here to stay. It offers too many business benefits, but it is also an existential threat to the existing banking industry because it disintermediates them. I don't need a bank to hold my money. I don't need a bank to approve me for a loan. I don't need a bank to facilitate the settlement of my trade. I just simply don't need a bank. And this is an existential threat. And that is my opinion, why Jamie Dimon runs around the country saying, I hate Bitcoin. And if I were the government, I would ban it <laughs> um, because it's a competitive threat. Yeah. Uh, Jamie has now fully recognized that he's looking really silly when he makes statements like that. And in fact, his bank, JP Morgan, is one of the leading users and developers of blockchain technology. The Onyx blockchain built by JP Morgan settles $2 billion a day in transactions. His traders are among the most active in Bitcoin uh, activities uh, around the world. And it's now gotten to the point where Jamie Dimon, just a couple of weeks after he said in a Senate hearing, I would ban Bitcoin if I were the government, Two weeks later, he said, I will defend your right to own Bitcoin yeah. because he recognizes there's too much money to be made. And banks around the world who are recognizing that blockchain technology is an existential threat rather than trying to ban it, which they failed to do, they're now embracing it. You know, the old adage, if you can't beat them, join them. So banks around the world are all developing blockchain technology. They are all embracing this. They recognize the incredible business benefits. And this, I think, will prove to be the ultimate uh, realization of Satoshi's original goal. Mm. Now, on that note, um, to your point, right, they're trying to stop this. And we see within the government, specifically the SEC, look, the EIA and the Elizabeth Warrens of the world and so forth are trying to put up as many roadblocks as possible. The SEC only approved the Bitcoin spot ETFs because the courts made them do it, right? They took a massive loss, got called arbitrary and capricious. Right. What are your thoughts on that? Is it is it just an administrative thing, but also, or maybe going back to these folks are getting disrupted, they, they don't understand it fully, they're trying to catch up and they're just having knee-jerk reactions? 
Yeah, there are there's speculation that Gary Gensler is in the pocket of Elizabeth Warren. You know, how does a guy who taught blockchain at MIT become so anti crypto when he gets to the SEC? It doesn't make any sense. He's never been able to offer a rational explanation for his opposition. Congress is furious at him. He just got nailed again yesterday. A court ruled that the SEC acted with severe overreach far beyond their uh, regulatory authority uh, in a lawsuit it had taken out against uh, yet another crypto company. Uh, Gensler runs around the country bragging about all the enforcement actions he's taking against the crypto community in the absence of regulation. Uh, and nobody's in favor of it. There was a meeting last summer, uh, an part of an annual meeting they do of all the former SEC commissioners, and unanimously, they all opposed Gensler's handling of crypto. So Gensler's on an island all by himself, and he's out of office at 2026. We have to tolerate him between here and there. Bottom line is there are politicians who don't like crypto for the same reason bank executives don't like crypto. It eliminates government control the way it eliminates bank control. And people like Elizabeth Warren, who love to control the American consumer, don't want to lose that control. Uh, this is why so many uh, who believe in uh, free markets, who believe in capitalism, this tends to be a Republican platform, they love crypto. Even Donald Trump has said that he likes yeah. Bitcoin. Uh, it is routine to see Republican members of the House and Senate endorse it. There are dozens and dozens of members of Congress on both parties who are members of the um, Senate blockchain caucus. Uh, so there's a lot of support on Capitol Hill, but there still remains some opposition. But their numbers are getting fewer as their arguments are getting weaker uh, as Bitcoin continues to get stronger. So it's it's we've seen this in every new innovative technology. You know, when you go back to the automobile, people hated those things. They were noisy. They were loud. They were dirty. They were dangerous. And everybody who sold horses for a living considered cars an existential threat. Uh, and buggy whip manufacturers wanted nothing to do with uh, automobiles. Um, they, lived, they ended up losing the argument and the crypto haters today will end up losing the argument as well. Yeah, it's funny. I, I've often I've seen some of the political cartoons and the things that were in the media back in, in the early 1900s about electricity. And there was like demons coming through the electricity lines. And then I'm assu assuming they did the same thing for the automobile. So every new technology does disruptive. You have people look. In general, humans hate change, right? Change is hard, but then you have this very disruptive technology. You're going to have the incumbents. And, uh, and people that. will make crazy arguments to oppose a new technology. I, uh, one of the arguments move, used against railroads mm -hmm. when that technology came out is that if people ride in a railroad, in, in a railroad car, they'll suffocate. They'll be moving so fast, they won't be able to breathe. <laughs> That's uh, incredible. But I guess it's just human nature playing out, right, Rick? Um, well, you know, the, 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 those in power, those uh, who are successful, uh, don't want to give up their position. They don't want to be at risk, um, and they don't want to uh, go through the disruption. Uh, and nor, you know, and not, they're not always looking at it selfishly. They're often looking at it for the benefit of their employees. I mean, let, let's pretend a world where instantly – Blockchain technology rendered banks obsolete. Mm. How many tens of millions of people would be suddenly out of work? Mm. That disruption is very, very scary. And we need to recognize that fact. We can't be so cavalier that this new technology is the greatest thing since sliced bread, that we don't care about the implication that the disruption is causing. We need to help people adapt. And it, it takes people a while to do this. You know, historically, as we've gone through changes, we went from the agricultural economy to the industrial economy. That change occurred over a generation. The farmer didn't have to adopt. Their children were able to move into the industry. And then the industry was able to move into the offices when we went from the industrial age to the information age. These changes occurred over a generation. Now, due to computer advances, we're enga engaging in these changes not over a generation, but over a decade. Yeah, and that is creating massive disruption and real challenges for policymakers as we keep everybody employed, maintain the economy while fostering the innovation, so that we end up winning as opposed to 
creating a lot of damage in our effort to achieve the nirvana we're trying to get to. So it, it's complicated. So Rick, tough question to follow up on what you just said, because I've been thinking about these things. I have a six-year-old daughter and I'm thinking, what does her future look like? Um, you have, like you said, this, these technologies, very disruptive, moving at a rapid pace, changing the economy, changing the way we do commerce. You have AI, you got blockchain and crypto, and you have all these other technologies, EVs and, and all kinds of things. Um, with There's talks of AI taking jobs away. I think that will happen. Um, how do we run the economy moving forward? Is it UBI, universal basic income, and it, maybe blockchain is a part of it, and maybe CBDCs, unfortunately, which have benefits, but people are concerned about the privacy rights, where they pull these levers, they give you money, and it's verified on the blockchain, it's settled instantly, you can pay with it, um, and that's the way part of the economy is running because there's not enough jobs? There's no question that technological innovation is massively disruptive. Uh, in my book, The Truth About Your Future, which was a New York Times bestseller, I talk about all of this, that AI and robotics are very uh, big deals. Blockchain technology is a very big deal. Nanotechnology, big data, 3D printing, mm. uh, bioinformatics, um, fintech, edtech, agtech, all of these innovations are massively disruptive. And the scientists are telling us that they are anticipating that over the next decade, half of all the occupations in America will disappear. Mm -hmm. They'll be replaced by automation in some way or other. We're already beginning to see this. You know, Amazon has 200,000 robots running around its warehouses. Uh, cars are being made by robots. Uh, we, drone technology is rapidly being developed. So we, we see this happening in real time. And it means that a great many occupations are going to disappear. Brick layers will be gone because robots are already being able to make bricks and lay them and, and build a building with it. Uh, 3D printing or making 3D printed homes out of concrete uh, in a day. So we're already beginning to see this technology. While mi millions of people will discover that their jobs are gone, we will also see an incredible development of brand new occupations hmm. that never before existed. I mean, let's face it. Blockchain developer didn't exist 15 years ago. Right. And today it's one of the highest paid software engineering degrees and uh, occupations that there is. So we are going to enjoy a renaissance. We're going to get rid of the jobs of the past that were boring, that were dangerous, that were low paying. And we're going to create jobs of the future that are more interesting, more exciting, of more value, that are of higher pay, that are easier to do, that provide a better lifestyle and advance society. Mm -hmm. We have to retrain people who were bricklayers how to become workers in the 21st century. And business has a huge incentive for doing this. Uh, PwC just released a survey two weeks ago of the uh, CEOs of the largest companies around the world. These are companies with 100 million or more in annual revenue. 25% of them said that they are firing 5% of their staff this year because of AI. Mm -hmm. They also said they are simultaneously adding jobs because they need better skilled jobs. So they're getting rid of the people that AI can do the job for, and they're replacing them with people that know how to use AI is what it really comes down to. Uh, and at the same time, the most fascinating statistic out of that survey, 40% of these global CEOs said that if they don't change the way they do business, they will not be viable in 10 years. Wow. So we have to recognize we are undergoing right now a massive evolution as we move from the information age, remember we were agriculture age to the industrial age to the information age, now to the digital age. Mm -hmm. And the speed at which things move in the digital age is unprecedented in human history. And it's affecting every aspect of life on the planet. A lot of it, most of it is extraordinarily good and exciting. Some of it is a little scary, not just job loss, but everybody's fears of AI taking over the world or 
we can now 3D print guns out of plastic that uh, an x-ray machine at the airport doesn't detect. Uh, the ability for people to make dangerous weapons uh, and move them around through rogue nations or uh, drug cartels or bad players. Um, so the world has gotten scary. You could argue scarier, while it has also got it, gotten more exciting than ever. There's nothing new here. We've been in this kind of turmoil for millennia. Uh, and we need to recognize that what we've been doing for the last 50 years is not what we're going to be doing over the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. We need to learn. We need to adapt. We need to embrace. And we need to engage and protect. And uh, some of us are going to do a better job of that than others. Sure. It's the same, like you said, same story playing out, right? Adapt or die. Uh, always be learning and update your skills, right? Because, and, and like you said, it's moving faster now. Right. There was a, a one point somebody made the comment of an innovative um, invention in warfare that was described as the most devastating weapon ever devised that would uh, fundamentally alter uh, mankind's future. They were talking about the crossbow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like the nuclear weapon or something. <laughs> um, now, crypto is on the rise. You know, we talked a lot about adoption and so forth. Um, and, you know, we talked about the regulators not getting it right, the SEC. But Congress has to act. There's a couple bills in the House, couple in the Senate. Are you optimistic we might see something within this year or next year? I know the elections make things a lot uh, really messy, but what, what are your thoughts on that? We're not going to see any legislation this year. Um, because of the election. Um, we have to wait till next year. Depending who is elected will determine what we see. I am confident we will see legislation, but I'm not confident as to what it'll say. It depends on who wins control of the House and uh, the Senate and the White House. Mm. Um, Speaking sorry. strictly on a crypto perspective, ignoring all the other issues of the day, immigration, right to life, environment, education, healthcare, national debt, ignoring all the other really important things. So I don't want to be taken out of context here. If your lens is strictly focused on crypto, you must vote Republican. Hmm. Because the Democrats have made it clear, Joe Biden personally has made it clear that they hate crypto and want to eliminate it, want to control it, restrict it. And some, like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, want to outright ban it. So if you believe in, uh, if you want to focus on the uh, fostering an environment for the innovation and further development and broader ownership distribution, access use of blockchain and digital asset technology, you must vote Republican. Now, I will say what I just said, you have to put that into context. That's only that single issue. And I'm not suggesting that the crypto issue is as important as any of those other issues uh, or should trump all of those other issues, but you need to simply, not a bit of a bad use of word, but um, <laughs> we need to uh, just recognize the attitude of uh, the two political parties when it comes to the contact, uh, conversation of blockchain and digital assets technology. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And funny enough, you know, we saw in Super Tuesday, many of the candidates who aligned themselves to Elizabeth Warren, they started losing and the pro-crypto candidates were winning. So this is a ballot issue, but like you said, it may not be number one, but many crypto investors are single issue voters. I've noticed a lot of folks saying that. And uh, it's I think most Americans are single issue voters um, be and partly because of the incredible complexity of being a multi issue voter, mm -hmm. uh, because you might love your candidates views on immigration, but hate their views on right to life. You might love their views on capitalism, but hate their views on the environment. Uh, so you, ultimately, you're going to have to pick uh, and who knows the basis on which people pick it might be because uh i like how they talk or i don't like how they talk i'm and how many of us are going to be making a negative vote where the, i'm not voting for anybody i'm voting against the other guy hmm. so uh, at the end of the day i think that this that it all comes down to a single issue and you've got to decide what is the single issue that matters most to you and the rest of it you just hold your nose um, Rick, I, another question, and it was related to the disruption of technology, and it, I, I just want to make sure I ask you about this. The growing debt problem, right? And I'm thinking about the future. How long can they keep printing and printing and printing? Are we going to end, as the United States, at least, I'm, I can talk for the United States because I live here, end up like Argentina, right? Uh, 
or are, is there some sort of debt jubilee or uh, can they use bitcoin a blockchain how do you think they solve this so it the debt has has been an issue for uh, a long time and it is uh, now at uh, you know blinking red zone light status uh, we are now um at a point not only in the massive size of the debt but what really matters more is the deficit it's mm -hmm. not just how much how much do I owe, but how much do I have to pay this month on what I owe? Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden's budget that he just submitted to Congress for the first time ever has the government spending more money than the country produces in GDP. That is a very scary turn of events. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have to recognize is that the vast majority of the budget is obligatory, meaning entitlements. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and similar federal programs that are mandated by law to pay certain amounts of money to certain uh, individuals. And there's no debate, there's no uh, option, there's no conversation. This is what is required. Uh, total discretionary spending is only about 12 to 15 percent of the total federal budget. Um, defense spending is largely not optional. They can only choose a little bit at the margin, uh, how much to fund the defense uh, department, but most of defense spending is equally uh, mandatory. So you add the final element to this, and that is interest on the debt. We had a wonderful renaissance at the beginning of this decade because interest rates were at zero. Right. Treasuries were near zero. So we were spending very little uh, to pay off our debts. But now that interest rates are at 5%, treasuries are paying four and a half or better. The federal government is paying a massive amount of interest on the debt. And that is an expense it didn't have five or eight years ago. And this is cr making the problem a lot worse. So the question becomes, how long can the government keep this up? How long can it sustain it? The answer comes down to economic growth. In other words, as long as our revenues and GDP are exceeding government spending and government uh, cost of the debt, then you can have as much debt as you want. Um, as long as those other numbers are bigger. The problem is those other numbers aren't getting bigger. Uh, and we are, like I said, now seeing that the the total expense uh, for the government is exceeding our GDP. Mm. So we don't know what's going to happen yet. This is one argument people have for buying assets like Bitcoin uh, or yeah. gold or artwork, you know, assets that are inflation proof, so to speak. Um, we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. But inevitably, uh, there's going to become a reckoning. The issue is whether the reckoning is an Argentina style or a Zimbabwe style reckoning, uh, where in Zimbabwe they're printing five trillion dollar uh, bills, um, or whether it is more manageable the way the government has managed it so far. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But I think you make an argument, Tony, for owning at least a little bit of Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's why I I own Bitcoin. I have some. I am not selling it. It's gonna go to my daughter because I don't know what they're gonna do, right? And it, there's no solution being brought forth that, hey, look, this fiat currency system, fiat currencies fail every. I don't know at what the timeline is. They updated, but what what is the future gonna look like? So well, our currency is the oldest currency in the world, and it's only a couple of hundred years old. That tells you something because humans have been around for many, many thousands of years. Uh, governments also uh, don't last very long. Our government is the oldest in the world, and that doesn't bode well either. In Italy, their government since World War II has lasted on average 11 months. Um, so um, we have to recognize that turmoil is routine, uh, and along with political turmoil is economic turmoil, and the two tend to go hand in hand. Uh, this is why revolutions occur and coups occur and assassinations occur uh, and so on. So uh, it does get a little bit dicey, a little bit scary. We do need to recognize the macro environment that we're in, which is why I believe diversification is the the right approach. Um, don't 
make a big bet with any bit of your money, you should make a series of small bets. Uh, and I think that's uh, a safer, more prudent uh, approach. We have to recognize at the same time that uh, we've been through this generation, generationally in the past. Sometimes it takes a long time to work through crises. Look at the crash of 29, which took 15 years. Uh, look at world's, World Wars One and Two. Look at the pandemic. We're still feeling the impact of that. Um, so uh, people sometimes, I feel, run out of patience. And when we complain to Congress that they aren't fixing it, we have to remember that it's our fault. Because we say to Congress, do not raise my taxes. And we also say to Congress, do not cut my benefits. So on the one hand, you've got people telling Congress, don't raise taxes. And on the other hand, you have people saying to Congress, I want you to waive my student loan debt. Uh, Joe Biden just put in his budget, he wants to give every American family $10,000 to buy a house. He didn't say any, where that money was going to come from, nor did he acknowledge what's ten grand going to do for you when the average house costs four hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's just a, yet another government giveaway because people love free money. So um, Congress isn't fixing it because we're not letting them fix it. Mm. Uh, final question here before I let you go: um, AI. We were talking about on the rise. How do you think that impacts investing, and maybe? 50 years from now, AI is your registered investment advisor. The humans are not involved anymore. What are your thoughts on that? AI is going to change everything. As we know, we've all seen Hollywood movies that are an AI lived world. And a lot of that will come to pass. I think ultimately in the end, AI is going to make the world a much better place, a much safer place, uh, a much more affluent place for all of us. We are already a more peaceful world than we have ever been. We are a more affluent world than we have ever been. We are a safer world than we have ever been. Despite the fact that we hear all the stories every day of robbing, robberies and shootings and mass mayhem, and we're all horrified by what's happening uh, with uh, Ukraine and against Israel, and uh, and we're fearful of what's going to happen next in Taiwan. I mean, we, we've, we've always bounced from crisis to crisis, right. but the fact is technology makes the world a better place. It doesn't come without disruption. It doesn't come without turmoil. But in the end, I think we can all agree the world is a better place because we're driving cars instead of riding horses. Yeah. Uh, and so we just have to figure out how to get from here to there with minimizing disruption and pain for those whose lives will ultimately be disrupted. Rick, always great stuff. Always learn uh, something new when I uh, listen to you. So I appreciate you joining me. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.